singing and proclaiming that God is enough uh, as our provider. As Micah said, that he's provided for us our salvation through Jesus Christ. And there isn't anything better than that that he will ever provide for us. That is, that is the best thing that God has provided for us. But we also, in that song, referenced uh, Philippians 4, referenced Matthew 6, that God is the provider, that he meets our needs, that he takes care of us. And uh, if he's going to take care of the flowers of the field and the birds of the air, then, you know, he will take care of us as well. I got to tell you, this, this idea of Jesus being enough is unfortunately hard a lot of times for Christians to grasp because we keep trying to add stuff to Jesus and, uh, and we keep trying to make it, you know, like, okay, yeah, it's about Jesus, but it's also about Jesus and these other things. And I'm, I, I need us to know and I need us to understand that uh, Christ is sufficient for everything that we need for life and godliness. Christ is sufficient for all that we need to, to do and to be and everything that we could ever uh, live for, the, the, the way that we would glorify God. So a couple of thoughts. One, today we're going to be, uh, sorry, I forgot to do this in the first service. So Romans 6, meet me in Romans 6, and that's where we'll begin. But we're going to talk today about a proper perspective of sin because probably one of the questions that I get asked more often than others is this idea of what what's a Christian's view towards sin? What should be our view towards sin? And one of the things that we need to be really careful of is that we're not trying to adopt a view towards sin that like applies to people who don't know Jesus. So for example, Isaiah 59 uh, verse 2 says, your sins have made a separation between you and God. This isn't talking to Christians. Isaiah 59 is not talking to Christians. Isaiah 59 is talking to the Israelites who have rejected God and are serving uh, idolatrously. They're serving idols. And he talks about that. We, we, I, unfortunately, for 20-something years, probably 25 years, used Isaiah 64, 6. All of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. But the context of Isaiah 64, 6 would be those without Jesus, those apart from Christ. Their righteous deeds are like filthy rags. Their righteous deeds have no merit and have no value. And it goes back to chapter 1 in Isaiah where God says uh, through the prophet Isaiah, I hate your assemblies. I hate your festivals. If you pray to me, I won't hear it. And it's because they have rejected God. They're idolaters. We use these verses sometimes to talk to Christians, but the context wasn't Christian. It was people who had rejected the Lord. We have to be really careful with that, that we don't, as Christians, adopt a non-Christian view of sin. Here's what we have on tap today. Our theology is this. For the person of faith, sins of today are not counted against them. For the person of faith, sins of today are not counted against them. Our application is this. Having been made new, we must seek to have our behavior align with our identity in Christ. Having been made new, we must seek to have our behavior align with our identity in Christ. And our prayer today is, God, remind us of our holy and righteous position before you and bring our lives into submission to the Holy Spirit. The family focus today, if you have young ones at home, is God gives us the desire and the ability to glorify him. God gives us the desire and the ability to glorify him. One of the biggest problems that I see in Christendom, and, and if I'm just being completely honest, it's how I was raised. This was the first 40 years of my life. So it's how I was raised in 20 years of churches and then how I preached for the next 20 years, and I was wrong. And the way that I would preach more or less was put faith in Jesus for salvation, which that part's right and beautiful, and always will be. And then I would say, and here's all the rules you need to follow as a Christian to be a good Christian. And I didn't say it quite that blatantly, but it's still what I was teaching. I was teaching a dependence upon Christ for salvation and a dependence upon our own efforts for maintaining righteousness. And I want to be very, very clear. The law, the works of the law, the, the rules never had the capacity to make anyone righteous, ever. And adherence to the rules cannot then maintain righteousness, they can't. Uh, the law cannot protect or safeguard holiness. It just doesn't. And I want to look at a couple of places here today. So today we are only talking about how the Christian should view sin. Uh, there, this would be too long of a sermon if I tried to talk about how we should view sin as a problem in the world or how we should view sin if we're not saved. Today we are only talking about the believer's view of sin. And I'm going to begin in Romans 6. I'm going to begin in verse 5 and... I really, really, man, 6-5 is way after I really want to start, but I already have too much I want to say, and so we're not going to get through it all, and it was not best to break this sermon into two parts for a couple of reasons, and I will quit. Uh, 
commentating on my own thoughts right now. So, probably not, but we can hope. Uh, Romans 6, 5. For if we have been united with him, that's Christ. People ask me every week, what translation do you read from? I read from the ESV, sort of. I usually take the pronouns in this case, for we have been united with him, that's Jesus. So I usually take the pronouns and apply them to Jesus or God or whoever they apply to. Uh, I will add clarifying words from time to time. So sort of the ESV is what I read from. If we have been united with him, that is Christ, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self or our old man or who we were before Jesus was crucified with him in order that the body of sin would be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. This verse right here, I got to tell you, should be like something that we as Christians herald and proclaim and rejoice over. We've gotten this mindset that the grace of God was sufficient to provide forgiveness of our sins so we wouldn't go to hell. And we have missed the fact that the grace of God is also sufficient to empower godly living. Okay? And so he says this, we know that our old self, in other words, who we were before Christ, was crucified with Christ so that the body of sin would be brought to nothing. Another translation I love says, so that the body of sin would be rendered powerless or would be rendered inoperable, so that who we were without Christ would be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to what? Sin. We are no longer, as Christians, we are no longer enslaved to sin. We're free from it, okay? And he goes on to say this, for the one who has died has been set free from what? Sin. You're not just set free from the consequences of it, you're set free from its power. Sin is no longer master over you. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. Uh, This is kind of a callback to verse 4 where he says we've been raised to walk in newness of life. We know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death Christ died, he died to sin once for all. And the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. Dead to sin and alive to God. Who are we as Christians? We are dead to sin. We've been set free from sin's power. We are no longer in slavery to it. And we are alive to God now. Our lives belong to God. And, and here's... The, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I get... doesn't matter. Romans 6.15. If you're new, yes, I'm always like this. <laughs> Romans 6.15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness? Now, if you heard Ryan preach from 20 to 40 years old, here's what you heard Ryan say about this text, and Ryan was wrong. And by Ryan, I mean me if you're thinking I'm talking about somebody else. I do have a pastor buddy named Ryan, but that's not who I'm referring to. What I used to teach was this, and I would stand in front of a group of Christians and I would say, listen, you have to choose today if you're a slave of sin or a slave of obedience. You have to choose today. Are you going to be a slave to sin or are you going to be a slave to the things of God? You have that choice. Romans 5.16, sorry, Romans 6.16 is not saying that you have the choice. It's not what it's saying. It's saying back in, in, back in the verse that we read a minute ago that your old self has been crucified. Who you used to be is dead and you've been made new. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, the old things have passed away, all things have become new. It's not that both of these things exist in the heart of the believer. It's that this is who you used to be and this is who you are now. You have been changed. It is a matter of identity. Because he says here, don't you know that you're slaves to whomever you obey, sin which results in death or obedience which leads to righteousness, and for whatever reason... 30-year-old Ryan didn't love context very much, and he was stupid and arrogant. So 6.17 says this, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you are now committed, and having been set free from sin, you are slaves of righteousness. This is what you've become. Christian, we've, we've taught this poorly for so long. We've said both of these things exist in the heart of the Christian. They don't. You were a slave to sin. You are now a slave to God. You have been made new. 
So part of, our, part of the way that we Christians need to think about sin isn't that this is just something we're destined to do. People all the time say, well, sin's inevitable. Based on what? Based on the fact that everybody continues to do it is probably what we would say, right? Well, do you, here's what everybody says. Do you know anybody who doesn't sin? That's, the, that's everybody's kickback to me every time. When I, and so they say sin's inevitable. And so I always look them in the face if they're married. It doesn't work if they're not married. And I look them in the face and I say, I'm really sorry to hear about your future affair. And they'll say, well, no, 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 I'm, I'm not going to have an affair. I'm like, well, you said sin's unavoidable. If sin's unavoidable, then adultery's unavoidable. It's going to happen at some point. No, 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 I would never do that. And I'm like, oh, so you think it's about what you can do. The, the, the power over sin isn't, doesn't rest in yours and my heart. It rests in the power of Jesus' death and his resurrection. And, and, and sidetracked, pause, come back. You can ask my wife. I've been really struggling with this sermon all week because there's so much, so much that I want to say to you. This idea of being enslaved to sin. See, one of the things that Christians do is they try to, they try to kind of take the law and make the law, make the rules be the guidelines for Christians. So we say, look, you've put your faith in Christ. Great. Now memorize the Ten Commandments. Memorize these instructions. Here's an instruction on tithing. Here's an instruction on how to do alcohol or not do alcohol. Here's an instruction on how to be properly angry. And we add all the law back in. I need you to hear this and I need you to grasp it because it is super, super important. The law was never capable of making anyone righteous and therefore cannot be capable of maintaining righteousness. The law cannot do that. 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 11 says that the law is a ministry of death. It is a ministry of condemnation. Hebrews chapter 7 says that the, 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 uh, the first covenant of the law it became obsolete, that the law was powerless. So why do we keep giving Christians the law as a standard to combat sin? It, it, it will fail every time. It, it, Listen, so this idea of slavery to sin is directly connected to the law. Slavery to sin and the law are, are, oh man, again, we don't have time for all this, but listen to me very carefully. This is from Galatians 3, 4, and 5. Galatians 3 says this, now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed, and so then the law was our guardian until Christ came, right? And then he says in chapter 4, uh, he says, in the same way, we also, when we were children, we were enslaved to the elemental principles of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, to redeem those who were under the law that we would receive adoption as sons. He says again in chapter 4, formerly when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those things that by nature are not God. He's talking here about the law and sin. He says in Galatians 4 later on, speaking of Abraham's two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, and I feel I have to point this out every time just in case you're in a Bible trivia game this afternoon. Abraham had eight sons, but there's only two that we ever talk about. So Abraham's son, Ishmael, he represents the law and he represents sin and death, and Abraham's son, Isaac, represents faith. And if you haven't caught this, they're two different people. It's two different people, just like we were somebody else, and then Christ came in and changed us and made us new. I'm a different person now than I was before I met Christ. I'm different. So why do I use the standard that I had before I met Christ as the measure of whether or not I'm doing this Christian thing well? He even goes so far as to say, and we use this verse wrong all the time, but he's talking about the law. And he's talking about sin through the law. And he says in Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It is for freedom from the law that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Christian, you have been set free from the law. So our approach, so my first thing is this. As Christians, our relationship with sin can't be, it cannot be approached through the law. It can't be about, well, I, I violated these rules this week, or you didn't violate these rules, so you're good. The other thing that we got to keep in mind is it cannot change our position before God. Romans 8 1 says, There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. 
We, we have been made new. He, he says in Romans 8, 8 and 9, he says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And he says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If the spirit of God dwells in you, Christian, we have to realize that we have been made new. We're new people. Our, our approach to sin has to be different than a standard of rules and regulations. Listen to this from 1 Corinthians 6. Let me move over here to our application. Our application is this. Having been made new, we must seek to have our behavior align with the identity we have in Christ. Having been made new, we must seek to have our identity uh, our behavior aligned with our identity in Christ. Listen to this. This is 1 Corinthians uh, 6. Paul says, beginning in verse 9, and we love the first part of this, and we miss the second part of this. Uh, we don't love the first part of this. We use the first part of this to kind of like... Anyway. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. Such were some of you, but you're not anymore because now you have been washed in the blood of Christ. You have been justified. You have been made righteous, not by adherence to the law, but by the work of Christ on the cross. We, we Christians, we, we have to quit... We have to quit letting this, the, the law be the standard of whether or not somebody's a good Christian. We've got to quit doing that. We, we, we have to quit judging others and ourselves based on whether or not we feel like they're adhering to the law. And we've got to start asking ourselves the question like, are, are you representing Jesus? Are you making much of Christ? I, I believe the Bible. I believe it with my whole heart. I, I, saw, I saw a quote on Facebook this week that kind of made me mad. That's every day almost. But uh, this, this one in particular said, they said, it's not the teacher, it's not the preacher, it's not, the, uh, it's not your friend that you're mad at. It's the Bible that you're mad at. It's God that you're mad at because God is the one who wrote the Bible. And I thought, well, that's not true. I know preachers and teachers all the time who mishandle the Bible. I know people all the time who wield it in a way that isn't scriptural. Like sometimes I'm mad at those people because they're not using it correctly. Right? Like if the Bible correctly understood, and I am not saying that I have, what's the word that I want? I don't know. It's there. I can't find it. Uh, huh? No, that's not the one I want. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying, like, when you say, like, oh, I know it all, I have it all, like, I'm not saying that I own, I don't know. I can't find it. It's in there somewhere. It's not always this bad. <laughs> I, I, I don't know everything. I have come to know the Bible better than I used to. I'll say that. But, but we, the Bible rightly taught is beautiful. And the Bible poorly wielded is harmful. And so when we, when we make it about the law rather than Christ, we harm people. Because all the law can do is bring death and condemnation. Anybody who has a law mindset is either very arrogant or very condemned and beaten down. You either feel like you're crushing it and therefore better than everybody else. That was Ryan until he was 16. Or you believe that you're doing a terrible job and you hate yourself. And that was Ryan from 16 to 40. And until you come to the place where you go, Jesus is enough. And you rest in Christ. And we go, but how then do we deal with sin? Don't we need a rule? No, we need Jesus. Listen, I, I believe the scripture. And when it says in Galatians 5, 16, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. I believe it. I believe it. 
I believe that God is bigger than me. I believe that the spirit of God at work in me is bigger than me. I believe that I have been set free from the power of sin and death. I believe that I am no longer in slavery to it. I believe 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4, that I have everything I need for life and for godliness, that I can be a partaker of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in this world through lust. I believe that I have been sealed by the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1, and I believe that the Holy Spirit in me draws me into the presence of Christ day after day after day, and the only only in him will I be a different kind of person. See, in Galatians 2, when Peter was rebuked by Paul, because Paul made some poor choices, I don't have time to go into it. When, when, when Paul rebuked Peter, he didn't say, you're violating the law. He said, your actions are not in step with the gospel. And that gets to the heart of how the Christian should view sin. I'm not looking at my sin going, oh, you should do this thing or not do this thing. If you're a parent in here, we, we, we tell our parents, avoid these things because these things may harm you. And there's some maybe wisdom in that, but we've got to be really, really careful because what we ought to teach our kids is, look, if you've put faith in Christ, you are righteous and holy and loved. You are a child of God, and so let your behavior conform to who you are. Let your behavior align with the identity you have in Christ. Look, there's a time to be angry. I know that because God gets angry and God doesn't sin. So there's a time to be angry. Ephesians 4 says, be angry and do not sin. But on the other side of that coin is James chapter 1 that says everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger doesn't bring about the righteous life that God desires. The law has people going, you can't be angry as a Christian. And I say, no, 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 there's an appropriate time to be angry. And there is a time that it doesn't glorify God. All you parents who are teaching your kids not to hit, <laughs> okay. I have taught my kids the appropriate time to hit. If you don't believe that there's such a thing, how many kids go missing every day? For real. I have told my kids throw elbows, throw punches, bite, pinch. Do There's an appropriate time to hit. You see somebody who is weak, who cannot take care of themselves, who is being abused, you step in. There's an appropriate time to defend. But the guideline for my family isn't the law. The guideline for my family is glorify Jesus. That has to be the guideline, doesn't it? Man, first service people really missed out. This is way better than the first service. <laughs> I can't wait to see what happens in third. <laughs> Listen, when Paul addresses sin, he does address sin. I'll, I'll say it this way. Let me back up. When Paul addresses Christians 40 times in the New Testament, he calls them saints. He never once addresses Christians as sinners. Not one time. Not once. We are saints. We are holy ones. We are chosen ones. We are appointed people of God. That's who we are. And from that perspective, we address our sin. I am a holy chosen saint of God most high. I am made new. I am righteous. I am holy. I am sanctified. I am here for the glory of the Father. We have this mind in ourselves that we should do what, what glorifies and makes much of Jesus. So when Paul addresses sin, he addresses it a very specific way. So Colossians chapter 2, Colossians 2, beginning in verse 20, and really we need to begin earlier than that, but Again, we don't have time. Listen, I'm telling you, I would preach the entire Bible to you every week if I could. I just would. Colossians chapter 2, it starts this way, okay? Uh, it doesn't start this way. Colossians 2.20 starts this way. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why is if you're still alive in the world do you submit to regulations, i.e. rules, i.e. law, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, all referring to things that perish as they are used? These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom, an appearance of wisdom, self-made religion, asceticism, and severity to the body. Hear this. But they are of no value in stopping the sinful cravings of the flesh. Okay, so here's what he said. Look, he goes, you died with Christ, right? 
Yes, I did. I put my faith in Jesus, so I died with him. And he says, so why are you still living according to the law? Why are you still living according to the rules? Those things can't stop the flesh. Those things can't stop sin. And then he gets to Colossians 3.1, where it says, since then you've been raised with Christ. Let me just, this is a footnote for you really quickly. You cannot begin a thought in Colossians 3.1 without at least going back to Colossians 2.20. Because Colossians 3.1 says, if then you've been, since then you've been raised with Christ, and you can't be raised with Christ unless you've first done what? Died with Christ, which happens in 2.20. Remember, the chapter breaks and all those were added in later. This is one thought by Paul. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your mind on the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not the things of the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ Jesus, who is your life, appears, you will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, the earthly things, sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, and covetousness, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming, but in them but uh, in them you once watched, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Like, here's what he's saying. Listen, he's saying the rules, the rules don't deal with the sin in your heart. And he says what deals with the sin in your heart is that your mind is set on the things of Christ and that when your mind is set on the things of Christ, you recognize those things in you that are not heavenly, but earthly, and you put them to death. By the way, by the power of the Holy Spirit and not effort of your own. It isn't submit to your own strength and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Uh, it is submit to the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit and you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. Uh, Colossians 3, if you keep reading down in verse 17, says, So whatever you, ever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It, whatever you do, you do it for Jesus. We submit our lives to Christ. And as parents or as, as people like me who lived under the law for so long, we, we're so worried and we're so fearful. And we're like, yeah, but what about all these sins that might creep up on me? They are no longer your master. They are no longer more powerful than the spirit of God that you have alive inside you. In every temptation, there's a way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But in everything, God will provide a way of escape that you may bear up under it. There's not a single temptation that has faced you that Christ did not face. There's not a single temptation that will face you that Christ didn't overcome and you have the power of the Holy Spirit alive inside you so we don't like listen here's how here's here's what shifted in my brain instead of looking at my sin from yesterday going man I violated x y and z law which is only going to make me feel stupid and small and frail I look at my sin on yesterday and I say that didn't have to be a part of my story anymore because of the spirit of God that reigns in me That doesn't have to be part of who I am. It's not who I am anymore. I've been made new. I'm done with that. We, we've got, I don't know, 100 people in here today. In Acts, there were 120 people in the upper room. Later, the Holy Spirit came. Whether that was on the 120, we don't know. Some think yes, some think no. I don't think that's the point we need to argue right now. It's a, I have thoughts, but it's not important. Pretend that's us. And the gospel permeated the world from the 120 people in that room. And I just, I just wonder, I wonder if we went out from here, are, are, we living, are, are we living for the law or are we living for the gospel? I, I, I just wonder what message the world, if we were the ones that were in charge, if we were the ones that were going to have to permeate the earth with the gospel of Jesus Christ, would they learn to depend on Jesus or would they learn to depend upon the works of the law? What would they learn from us? Would, would they learn that righteousness is a matter of faith and that holiness is a matter of the spirit at work in us and that it has nothing to do with what I bring to the table or how well I follow the rules or how many times I've maybe violated them? Would the world come to know Jesus if it just mattered with the second service of the 456, if it was just up to us? Are, are we living our lives so much for the glory of God that people would see that there's something different in us? Or do we look so much like the world 
and that it would be missed completely. See, I'm not smart enough to understand the fullness of this text. So if you're looking for a conversation after church about this text, I'm going to tell you I'm not smart enough to fully understand this text. That's why I'm telling you now, so you won't ask those questions. It is amazing to me how many times I'll say that in a sermon and people will come up to me afterwards and go, I want to ask you a question about that. And I'm like, I already told you, I don't know. 1 John chapter 3 says this, beginning in verse 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he, that's Christ, appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in Christ continues in their sin. No one who continues in their sin either sees him nor knows him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of their sin, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot continue in his sin because he has been born of God. By this it is obvious, those who are the children of God and those who are the children of the devil, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. When we are made new and filled with the Holy Spirit, there is a Godward move in our life directed by the Holy Spirit that draws us further and further into the person of God that we delight in him and we rejoice in him. It's not that there's never any sin, but he uses this idea of the people who are making a habit of their sin, the people who are making a practice of their sin. The people who are like, yeah, yeah, I know all the things about Jesus, like my father. I just don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. How can you know God and just say, I'm going to do whatever I want to do? Now, where we have to be careful is what we tend to do is we tend to go, I don't like what you're doing. Let me point to you a verse in the Bible. Like, listen, I'm just going to tell you, there would be a lot of us in this room that would be very unhappy with the way Paul handled himself in a lot of situations. And we'd say, I don't think that's very nice. Paul was, Paul was very direct. People are like, I, I don't think you should use certain language. I don't think certain language glorifies Jesus. Then you're going to have to have a conversation with Paul. Because Paul used some really hard and heavy language sometimes, very direct language. Like, I'm just going to, look, Jesus straight up looked at people in the face and said, you belong to the devil. You know, like sometimes that's the appropriate thing to say, you know? So it can't be about the law. It has to be about glorifying Jesus. It has to be about honoring God. But we tend to continue to default to the law. Man, there's a lot of other things that I want to say, but I will say this. We have got to quit measuring sin by the law and start regarding sin according to our identity. And what I mean by that is, don't look at your failures of yesterday and say, here's the rule in the Bible that breaks. Look at your failures of yesterday and say, this is not consistent with who I am in Christ. This is not who I am anymore. This, did not, this was not the correct representation of Jesus. It has to be about our identity. The law has never been a safeguard against sin. We've got to quit using it as one. But you know what? You know what does guard us from sin? The spirit of God that reigns in us now. The fact that we've been made new creatures. Listen, there are a hundred other things that I want to say in 20 or 30 other texts I would love to point you to, but we are out of time. Christian, your sin is not making a separation between you and God. Don't read Isaiah 59.2 as though it's written to you. It is written to idolaters who have rejected the Lord. Your sin, Christian, your sin has been dealt with by Christ. Christian, you are forgiven and righteous and holy and a saint. Christian, there is no condemnation for you because you are in Christ Jesus. Christian, you have been made new. How then do we talk about our sin? We say, this thing is not consistent with who I have been made to be in Christ. And that's why it must die. Here's our prayer today. God, remind us of our holy and righteous position before you and bring our lives into submission to the Holy Spirit. Take a moment to pray that where you're seated, please.
And God, there are a hundred more things to unpack. But what I pray, Lord, that you would write on every one of our hearts today is that those of us who have put faith in you, we are righteous and holy and loved and forgiven. We are saints. We are the holy ones. I pray, God, that you would remind us that the things in us that do not line up with the gospel are an affront to the gospel. And I pray, Lord, that you would use our lives to bring you glory and our lives to bring you honor and that in everything we do, Lord, that the gospel of Jesus Christ would be represented. I pray, God, that you'd help us to remember that the law could never save, could never make holy, and that we would quit relying on as a, a means or a practice and that we would rest fully, as we sang about a moment ago, fully on you, Jaira, our provider, that we would put all of our hope and all of our trust and all of our rest in Jesus. We thank you that you've given us the Holy Spirit to teach us and to guide us and to draw us further into your presence. We pray, Lord, that you would, would stir us up by the Holy Spirit, Lord, that we would, we would submit to you in all things and that whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we would do it for your glory, that in every word and every deed, we would do it with you in mind for your glory and for your honor that the world might see who you are. 